as I've gone through this, I've looked at it, and we run an educational research institution, and we think this was the American Revolution, Revolution, right? It was, it was all about efficiency. It was all about the assembly line. It was all about the, the work that Frederick Winslow Taylor did on efficiency. And we transferred that. It worked. Did it work? Yeah. Um, to this, right? If it worked for Henry Ford to have a bunch of people in his, in his shop putting things on, then it should be working just fine for kids when we had to move them into these classrooms. So we have the assembly line kind of thing going on. And now I'm going backwards. Ah, between Rachel and I. We're gonna, but kids aren't machines, right? This is my youngest grandson, by the way. I got permission to use this picture. <laughs> Isn't he a cute kid? Okay. So, kids aren't machines. And as we have developed these programs for the last 27 years, um, at, uh, starting with our observatory until today, one of the things we've decided is there are some things that we believe and uh, some things we need to do. So what if instead of, instead of school being about time, not about learning, it was about learning and not about time, right? And to do that, there are some basic beliefs that we have. And these are the things that we believe at the Lewis Center. First of all, that every child is uniquely created and one of a kind. You know, you all watch CSI, right? Somebody does something wrong in here, like falls asleep, and we do a DNA test to find out who it was. We got gotcha. you. Okay. But every moment is a teachable moment. And we try to get that to our parents as well. Right? Every time you deal with your child, some bit of information is going to come across. And how you deal with them is going to be important. And every environment is a teachable environment. Kids don't have to be in boxes, in rows, and in seats to learn. And every circumstance is a teachable opportunity. So let me tell you the rest of the story before I finish the lesson of what we believe about teaching remedial reading. It was absolutely the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. And the rooms were warmer than this out there in the desert, and it's kind of dark, and the kids were going around, and more than once, a child pushed me and said, I'm done. And I just said, hey, don't wake me up, just keep going. <laughs> so, I went, I heard about the Young Astronauts Program in 1985, first of the year in 1985, and I went to my principal and I said, Mr. Quimby, I called him that whenever I wanted something. Um, the name wasn't even Quimby, but anyway. <laughs> I went to him and, uh, and said, this astronauts program sounds cool, and I'd like to take kids every day, and I'll take first graders on Monday and second graders on Tuesday. I'll take 30 kids a day if you just take me out of remedial reading. He said, you're gonna have to sell that to the rest of the staff. Now, how many of you are, how many of you are teachers? Any speech teachers, I could use that. Okay, you know what a staff meeting's like, right? How many principals? You really know what a staff meeting's like. When I became a principal, my first staff meeting, I held up a sign that said, no whining. The whole place broke out in whining. Yeah, you know, what do you mean we can't whine? So, <laughs> so I'm in the teacher meeting and I stand up and I say, look, I'll take five of your kids. We had six classes in each grade level. I'll take five from each of your rooms. Monday, I'll take the first graders. Tuesday, I'll take the second graders. I'll take all those kids. And please, don't send me your gifted kids. Send me kids that like to do hands-on things. Now, between my lips and their ears, what they heard is, I can send you my five worst kids <laughs> in half a day, right? So I had the 150 children who knew the principal's office better than the principal knew the principal's office. In, a, in our annual, they all had numbers underneath. I, it was amazing. <laughs> so, they all show up, okay? And they come into, into the room, and I said, look, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna do all these things. The only thing is, you've gotta get your work done in class, and you can't get in trouble. And then we made astronaut food, we spun kids in chairs, we measured how big dinosaurs would be, we took a hula hoop, figured out how far away Pluto would be, they're still kept walking. And uh, yeah. so we did all those things, right? And kids had a ball. And the thing was, not only did their behavior change, 
their academic scores change. And without knowing it, and by accident, we changed the culture of the school. Changed the culture, and it was because they had fun, right? They had fun. So we believe that circumstances are all opportunities to teach. And every child needs to be engaged in two things for sure, and three positively. It needs to be relevant, and it needs to be rigorous. They need to know it means something, right? It needs to be something they can participate in. And it all hinges on this. Lasting relationships with caring, nurturing adults. Okay? Because those teachers and those principals and those parents are also uniquely created and one of a kind. We aren't an assembly line. There isn't a, anything made in a factory today that is as complex as the children in your classroom. And nothing is as sensitive and nothing that has such lasting memory. You know, if, if Ford makes a mistake, they recall a bunch of cars. We make a mistake, the country goes into depression, right? We need workers that are educated and it's our responsibility. So those are the things that we believe. And we believe that getting a good education is a lot of hard work. Do you agree? But there's no reason it shouldn't be a lot of fun, right? Those things are not mutually exclusive from one another. So um, after we got going on this, this whole thing with the Young Astronauts program around December, actually December 10th, 1985, Halley's Comet was up. See, now I can figure out how many of you saw Halley's Comet in 1985? Okay, so a lot of young people in the group. How many of you know who Halley's Comet is? <laughs> yeah, okay. Comet, named after Halley. All right, tough group. <laughs> so, kids need to have fun. These are some of our kids from Norton, and uh, these are some of our kids from the academy out in Apple Valley. Now, which girl do you think is seriously studying that Chuckawalla? <laughs> which one of you thinks is a little frightened by the Chuckawalla? And which one has the best opportunity to get away? <laughs> yeah. Well, our, our campus out there is 150 acres, and it is amazing. But I want you to know something that we have learned working with a number of the folks we work with at, at Loma Linda and UCR. A lot more brain research out there today. And the thing that, I, that we've discovered more than anything else is the, is the chemical cortisol, right? You guys have probably heard about that. That is the chemical that either causes you to flight, fight, or flee, or fight, flight, or freeze. Flee and flight would be the same. Anyway, so when your kids and get a test, when they're doing so, in fact, I'm gonna give you a test later. So. Those of you that weren't listening, that cortisol kick in and you'll say, I don't remember a thing. So the girl in front, she is what they would say in the, in the medical term, she's the predator. She doesn't feel any fright. She's been around chuckle balls before. She knows it's not gonna jump off of there and bite her, or at least she hopes it doesn't. And uh, she's not afraid. The girl behind her is freezing up. And the other one you see is turning, kind of turned her body. She's ready to get away anytime she can. So. Predators don't develop much cortisol. Right? They don't, it doesn't affect their brain much. So you never hear anybody say it was a lion caught in the headlights, right? No. Yeah. It was Bob caught by the lion. It wasn't, uh, yeah, so you never, you never hear that. But kids have that same reaction when they're afraid, when they aren't sure. And the more a victim you feel, the more you produce. So they say in America, the people who pr produce the least amount are usually white male CEOs of big corporations, right? Okay, I'm not telling you how to vote for president, I'm just saying. Okay, they say the people who feel the least are minority women in the ghetto. They feel the most victimized. So that amount, but our kids have that. Our kids are afraid. So. Good picture. There's Halley's Comet. Now you can all say you've seen it. It'll be on the test. Okay, so it was a cold winter night, a very cold winter night. It was December 10th, 1985. I had to run home. We had set up the telescope. My wife said, do you want to eat dinner before you go back? I said, no, I'll go back. 
These are the kids whose parents never show up for anything. They never come to school for parent conference. I'll go over for about a half an hour, wait for them, put the telescope back, and I'll come back. I drove back to school. Half an hour before we were supposed to start, 200 people were already lined up. And I thought, there might be something to this astronomy for elementary kids. And so they lined up and they stayed. They stayed till one o'clock in the morning. It was freezing. It got down in the teens. So hyperthermia set in and from there on out, everything is blamed on that. Okay. So have you ever felt like, you know, you get an idea. And, and I went back to my principal and I said, let's build an observatory. We could be inside when all those people show up. Inside. And he said to me, you know, let's go ask the superintendent. Now, I know that you know this trick. I didn't know it as a kindergarten teacher. Went to the superintendent, he said, that is the greatest idea I've ever heard. And then he said, if you'll raise all the money on your own time, you're in. <laughs> I went home and told my wife, he said yes. <laughs> so, the next five years were spent on the floor with my two little girls who are now 32 and 35. Don't speak to their father, but no, they, they're good kids. Anyway, so we went home, but this is, this is how I felt. Now, as a kindergarten teacher, um, you ever felt that way? Who will help me build the observatory? <laughs> Not I, I said. Yeah. Look, it'll be really cool. We had some interesting talks in the staff room at lunchtime, I can tell you. So I was looking for people to help me. We needed to partner with folks, just like Sherry said, and we needed to get people and interested. So, of course, I went to the people with money first, who said, well, our kids don't need an observatory, yeah. Then I went to some of my friends I was talking to, who'd known all my life, who were in the construction trade. And I said to them, I'd really like to do this. It'd be hands-on approach to stuff. And they said, if somebody had done that for me in high school or in elementary school, that would have changed my life. Everything was open the book, memorize the terms, take these tests, and, and I wish I'd done these other things. So it was all those groups, business owners of plumbing companies and, and cement companies and all those groups that came together and in five years, we raised $1.2 million in either in-kind donations or money and without the superintendent giving us a dime, we opened the Science and Technology Center. Okay, so, now the plane came a little later, but. <laughs> One day we got there and it landed. <laughs> anyway, and remember that staff room, you know? Well, one day I was in there and I said to them, I bet the Air Force has some extra flight simulators and wouldn't that be cool for kids to get in a simulator and be able to fly? Think of the math and all that stuff they would learn. And those teachers, they were cruel. They started laughing. Uh, they were laughing so hard, milk was coming out of their nose. It was just... <laughs> Elementary teachers, sorry for the high school people that are offended by that. Okay, so we go, I'm in there and I think, well, that's rude. And I went into the office and I said to the principal, Mr. Quimby, can I make a long distance phone call? And he said, sure, who are you calling? I said, I'd like to call the Pentagon. He said, okay. So I went in and I called the Pentagon and the lady answered and said the Pentagon, which meant I had gotten there. And then I said, I'd like to talk to who's ever in charge of used flight simulators you know, like used Toyotas. I didn't know what, you know. She said, to my surprise, she said, well, that would be Colonel so-and-so. I'll connect you right now. <laughs> She's probably thinking, how'd this guy get this number? Anyway, so Colonel picks up and I said, you know, we built this, this science center and we have a really close ally, Congressman Jerry Lewis, who had come on board from 1985 in about his third term as a congressman and said, that is a great idea and we'll come and speak. Using his name became very effective. And the colonel said, we do have a lot of used flight simulators. We've never given one to an elementary school, but we'd love to send you one. And three months later on a truck arrived a $360,000 T-40 flight simulator, which is housed in that building. And we can start kids at third grade teaching them to fly. Uh, because second graders don't reach the rudder pedals very well. So, <laughs> just gotta have that. So all these things came about because of the community. And once we got the observatory up, we needed more volunteers. 
And so we started the High Desert Astronomical Society and we said to them, you can play with our toys if you make sure that everything you do includes children. Okay? If you'll include them, if you'll teach them about astronomy, you can come over and use this observatory. They're still going today and uh, they open the observatory to the public twice a month and uh, for two days each time during the dark of the moon. <laughs> Sounds eerie, doesn't it? Um, but they, they do that and then they uh, go out to schools and they do astronomy programs and they do, they set up outside. So we, um, we ended up with 640 volunteers, um, all tagged. They were all part of the Starfleet. We stole that in case, anyway. <laughs> So, then we learned that NASA was going to get rid of one of their antennas. A bunch of kindergarten teachers, right? We said, oh, okay, let's go get it. <laughs> How big could it be, right? So we're all like, that'd be cool. So I call Congressman Lewis and say, hey, they're getting rid of an antenna, and uh, we think that would be neat for kids, and we'll move it over and put it on the playground. And then NASA told us, it's nine, feet tall, nine stories tall, weighs a million pounds, and you probably aren't going to get to move it. We were going to use the, the tanks at Fort Irwin to pull it over, and it was going to cost $2 million to tear it down. Um, so Congressman Lewis called his friend Dan Golden, who was the head of NASA, who was actually the head of NASA for three presidents, both Bush's and for, for Clinton. And uh, he said, Dan, I've got the, this guy's got this idea. So Dan Golden actually got on a plane with a, a NASA jet with his entourage and they flew to Apple Valley and came out and saw our science and tech center and he walked into the center and we were showing him around and we were doing a lot of kind of cool stuff with astronomy and what we've been doing and uh, it got later and later and I said you know we're gonna have to get out of here there's a group of kids coming in and this is a kids place this is all about students and uh, as we were walking out one of his aides turned to me and said that was the kiss of death you don't kick out the head of NASA out of a thing I said well well it's a kid place so they left, they had looked and they left, and I got a call from Mr. Golden, and he said, what convinced me is when you kicked us out, and it was all about kids. I said, fire your aide. Um, so, so Dan Golden became not only a, a supporter, but a good friend, and so we, they turned over DSS-12, and DSS-12 is a very large antenna. It was the antenna that communicated with the Apollo astronauts. So if you, if you can see from back there, right there is a five-ton truck. And the blocks of the white blocks that it's setting on are 12 feet tall. The dish covers a quarter of an acre. Okay? And this is gathering data from billions of miles away, billions of light years away. And so we, we took off all the heavy equipment to increase its life expectancy because we don't transmit out of it. And we turned it into a radio telescope, which means that we listen to these, the energy that's coming. So when we look at Jupiter, we're really measuring the temperature of Jupiter at different segments into the, into the atmosphere. Uh, when we look at a black hole, we're measuring the energy coming off of the black hole. So if you took all the energy that we collect on this massive dish for a year, it would light the light bulb in your refrigerator for one thousandth of a second. So it's very minute energy. And so we said, we think that we could write curriculum and kids could run this antenna. And NASA said, well, that'd be cool, but you know, JPL has to fax the directions to its engineers out of Goldstone and they run it and they send it back. And we said, well, you know, look, it's the 20th century. Why aren't you doing this remotely? And they said, well, we can't, you know, it's the federal government and it takes years and years to get all this new technology and all this stuff. And we said, well, why don't we do it? And we had a couple IT guys, and they, they must have been kindergarten teachers because they said, hey, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> so working with the NASA scientists on their time off, these guys created the ability for us to run this telescope over the Internet by remote control. Today, I can run it on my iPhone from here. So it, it runs from anywhere. In fact, now we're in 38 states, 14 countries, three U.S. territories, and I'm going to China in May about the Chinese kids getting to do this. We're already in Colombia, we're in the European countries in Japan, and on all the military bases. 
overseas. So they can run this. It's out of ITAR, which means it's out of the international tariffs. Um, so these kids run this, and they do real science and real work. This is mission control. And uh, these kids are from our school, so they go into mission control and run from there. But if your school was to come on, the training is all free. It's online. It takes about three hours for a teacher to train, and it's free to do it. So we, um, we have a mission control center. We have mission specialists that you're going to see in a second. And um, you run the telescope. You gather data. It's real data for NASA. And uh, it's a mutually beneficial partnership. NASA engineers have told us we've probably saved NASA around $1 billion in the data that kids have gathered. Because last year, there were 40,000 children running this telescope. Okay. This is the, if you look over on the right, that's what the screen looks like that the kids get on their screen. And the, it's how they run it. And then it shows, we actually have three antennas now, but there's a picture of two of them in one of this. So. Um, we, the program was so good and worked so well, we took over half of DSS-13 for NASA. And then uh, Star Wars antenna, which is in the upper right-hand corner, that's DSS-28. It was mothballed. It was a Star Wars antenna. It was supposed to track incoming missiles. Um, very, very fast-moving telescope. NASA turned that over to us three years ago, and we put about $2 million into it. NASA put $1.8 million into it. And it is now one of the most sophisticated radio telescopes in the world, with 16 different channels, can do all sorts of things. And the only way those scientists at JPL and Caltech and, and MIT can get on that telescope to do the work they need to do is to use kids. So if they don't partner with students, then they don't get to run it. Okay. We have got them. Okay. <laughs> so Elcross. I don't know if you remember back about a year ago, last October, before October, um, America sent a, a rocket to the moon to crash into the moon and see if there's water. That was the LCROSS mission. It took six months to, to orbit and come back and forth and do all this stuff. Well, the guys at Ames, NASA Ames, came to us and they said, NASA doesn't have time on their other antennas to track our spacecraft to make sure nothing happens to it. And you can't do that. It's like leaving your three-year-old alone at home. So they asked us if they could partner with us. And we said, sure, as long as you use. Yeah. Who's listening? As long as you use. Thank you. And those in the back, don't snore. OK. So what we did is we said, fine, we want to be part of that. In fact, they even sent a delegation of kids to the launch. Um, and we were on NASA TV and NASA online talking about the flight. And, and NASA and Ames, Na NASA Ames and Northrop Grumman, who built the spacecraft, decided to turn over all the watching of that spacecraft to fourth through 12th graders. What were they thinking? So for three months during the flight, our antennas tracked that spacecraft and at one time picked up uh, one of the problems that it had. It had to be fixed. And when, if you watch this at 4 o'clock in the morning when it happened, in fact, these students are sitting in mission control after being there all night long. And they're third graders. And uh, they're watching the culmination of the work they'd done for three months at our site. When that spacecraft crashed into the moon at 5,600 miles an hour to look for water, we were the ones at this site who said that the crash had happened because we lost its signal. And that's what NASA reported to the world is that Goldstone had gotten confirmation from us that it had happened. So uh, Northrop Grumman made a video that's on our website um, about we went back to the moon, and this time we took the kids with us. It's a great little video. So so we're going to try this. You going to do it from there, Rachel? OK. It'll slip around. Ooh. OK. They're in mission control right now. They're online to um, they're online to South Carolina. They've got a school on. So why don't you wave to the mission control people? I want you to know that this is live. That's Ryan waving back. So so it's real. It's real. Yeah. Okay, enough, Ryan. Put your hand down. Yeah. He looks way too happy, doesn't he? OK. Thank you. Uh, let's go back to the slide then and see if 
<laughs> Rachel's under pressure. Remember that cortisol stuff? Okay. Ah, good job. We also have have looked at other we've looked at other ways of getting kids engaged in science. This is Andrew uh, Chudden, and his he's written a book, two books on the moon, and so he came as a visiting author. So we try to help kids understand that science is what happens to you all the time and all around you. We've, um, we've gone to one-to-one -one laptops for our kids from fourth grade through 11th grade, and, or 10th grade and 11th and 12th are on iPads. Um, and we began to put together a number of things, including the K-16 bridge program that we started. Uh, this year there'll be school districts, a total of 100,000 students on bridge in nine community colleges here in California and one in Texas. And what we wanted to do and what the bridge program is aimed at and what the, the computers are is to change the way in which we measure how students are doing. There's a quote um, that I think is, is very interesting. I don't know if you know uh, or have heard of Sir Ken Robinson. You may have seen him on TED Talk and some others, but he's, a, he's an education speaker and very funny, but he's written a book called Out of Our Minds, Learning to Be Creative. And this is what he says. All over the world, governments are, print, are, are pouring vast amounts of resources into education reform. In the process, policymakers typically narrow the curriculum to emphasize a small group of subjects, tie schools up in a culture of standardized testing, and limit the discretion of educators to make professional judgments about how and what to teach. These reforms are typically stifling to the very skills and qualities that are essential to meet the challenges we face. Creativity, cultural understanding, communication, collaboration, and problem solving. How many would you, of you would agree with that that are in the classroom? Don't you feel like you're just being pushed by standardized testing? So what we wanted to do with our partners at UCR and uh, a number of other partners that we have, including uh, the ACT people, is what would happen if we could know on a daily basis where our child was, not only as a teacher, but as a parent? And what would happen if every standard or the new core standards were divided into their component parts and you could track a child to know where they were, do, do periodic testing online, and get real data back so that you as an educator could be both um, diagnostic and prescriptive, right? What if you could, could redirect that child and get to them early? What if you could let parents know that? What if high school students could have their GPA on a daily basis and know where they were? And if a, if a chart would come up on their computer for the schools that they want to get into, and what if when their GPA falls, one of those schools disappears? You know, and they click on what happened, and they say, "Dude, you have to have over a 3.8 to get into Harvard." You know, so what happens if that happens? What happens if all of them disappear, and a little icon comes up and says, "You can apply at McDonald's." Um, you know, really. So we've been building this system, and the system is is continuing to immerse through that process. But that's what we're looking to do, as a research institution. How can we take from testing kids in all these subjects and instead empower teachers back in their classrooms? We're convinced that if you want to change education completely, empower the people closest to the kids, their parents and the teachers. So if you, if you create schools that are schools of choice, you empower parents. If you empower teachers with their budgets to do whatever they need to do to empower kids, you empower teachers, right? It's not a tough thing, but until we get back to where teachers are empowered and allowed to teach, those of you in this room have got more educational experience and more education knowledge and brain knowledge than any generation before us. We're learning more about how the brain works, like Dr. Q said the other day, that just is incredible information that's coming out. We know more in the last 10 years than we know in the last 100 years. So we have to empower our teachers. You're the closest to kids, and kids are unique individuals. Well, other things we do at our site out in Apple Valley, I'm probably running over. Um, we, we thought we should get things going for kids outside of the school. 
Um, the school in Apple Valley is capped at 1,400 students. We have about 100 per grade level plus special ed. We have a higher percentage of special ed than any of the other schools in, our, in the district in which we're chartered. We have about uh, somewhere around 11 to 12 percent, including severely handicapped children. But we want kids to experience things. So we opened Mineral City. And in Apple Valley, uh, that was the home of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. And Mineral City was their, the name of their town, fictitious town, in their TV show. So they gave us permission to call our town Mineral City. And uh, just a bit of trivia and history and all that stuff. But we do two trips that are the most, um, besides aeronautics and these other things we do, there's two of our field trips that are the most popular. Third grade is called Wagons West, and it's the, it's the history piece for third grade about traveling across the continent and, and settling. And we do one for fourth grade called California Gold Rush. And so we have volunteers. Here's one of our volunteers right there. Tom is, is teaching kids to pan for gold in one of our ponds. And Trails West, they've got Conestoga wagons. You'll notice that each of these wagons is sponsored by a different business in our town. And uh, they pack up, and they get ready to go. And they head out through our wilderness, right? And uh, once they get out there, they run into a massacre at one place where something's happened. They aren't sure, but there's a turned over wagon. Uh, they have to look for Indian signs, see what's going on, because our land was the home of, of an Indian tribe for a lot more years than we've all been here. And then they get back to town, and the gold panners especially, they have to go in and sell their stuff back to Sam, the dry goods store owner. And he only buys it back at 10 cents on the dollar. So they, they earn money because we send them the curriculum to their schools. Uh, they do the curriculum. If they do it right, they earn miners' bucks. So when they get to town, they can go into Sam's dry goods store and pay exactly what you paid in, in 1849. So an egg was $2. The average miner in the streams up in the Sierras and that ice cold water could earn almost two dollars in a day. So, you know, you got that whole thing going on. They buy all their equipment. If they didn't earn enough, they have to make corn husk dolls or do um, stamping of leather. They have to make things until they earn enough money. They make candles and they come back and they get their stuff and they go pan for gold. When they weigh their gold, when they come back, the assayer's office tries to cheat them. So they really have to watch. And some of our students get to participate as well. And we, we start violin at uh, elementary level. We think the arts are a major part of the STEMs. And thanks to the Kawaiasu, Desert Kawaiasu tribe, we have 27 petroglyphs on our, uh, on our campus. A group of our students have used GPS to uh, record and mark where those are. We don't put them out because someone will graffiti over them or including they have found um, a cross that was carved into a rock by uh, Spanish soldiers in 1776 when they came through and camped on our property. So uh, it is an amazing place. The Mojave River runs through our campus. We have two uh, ponds. One of our students decided as an 11th grader that she wanted to study the Tui Chub. Um, I promised Gail I'd say that name because she really likes it. The Tui Chub is an endangered species of fish. Only a small group of them are found at Zizix, the research center out in the middle of the desert in a pond. And uh, this young lady decided that she would study them. She did that project for two years. It was picked up by the US Fish and Wildlife, and they gave us a big grant to build a second pond, transferred 500 of the fish to us, and we are raising those. There's over 1,000 in the pond now. And last, uh, last month, the kids actually took clippings Every 50 one they caught, 50th one they caught to measure and weigh, they took a clipping and they're doing DNA testing on it to see if the, if the group of fish have enough DNA difference that the population will be healthy. Now, where does that happen in a high school? The young lady whose science fair project is, is in her last year before residency at Loma Linda University Medical Center, and it's going to be a doctor. Um, People say, you know, if kids are out there having fun, does it work? Well, as a research center, we track our kids way after they leave. So we, um, we've been able to track 460 of the 842 graduates from 2010 graduating year back. We haven't started with last year. This is what's happened to those kids. Now remember, they're selected randomly. We have a lottery. We only have 1,400 kids in the school. We have a waiting list of 2,600. So every three months, every four months, we hold a lottery for the new gums coming in. So 
these are all randomly selected and we have we have to take whoever comes next there's no creaming off the top out of those uh, 369 81% went straight to college um, out of those here are their majors out of the out of those that were measured 138 of them are in stem fields um, then it goes down to social science films of 36 undergraduate 30 uh, undeclared 32 psychology 30 um, visual and performing arts we have a digital film studio we have 29 that are doing that um, liberal arts studies and then we track them to see if they graduate and then we're tracking them to see where they work so these kids are graduating we've we've graduated 98 to 100 percent every year including our special ed kids and all of them have passed the cas casey uh, by 10th grade including uh, special ed some of them in 11th grade before they passed it but some of these children are severely handicapped we have a number of one-on-one -on -one aids autistic children so they're uh, they're moving through the system and this way of doing things this project base is working um, we also have partnerships with Mojave Water Agency they've drilled four wells on our property they give us 10 acre feet a year to feed the ponds and our kids do all the monitoring of where the aquifer is where the water is how it's moving and so we try to use anybody that needs to come on our property if they have anything that's interesting to kids they get snagged so doesn't doesn't really matter you know if you're picking up the garbage and it looks like a cool deal we'll tell kids to go out and watch that we also have a greenhouse that was purchased by Mitsubishi cement they have to replant all the areas that they mine they have to bring back the original so topsoil and they have to plant them and it's very very difficult to get native desert plants to regerminate and to repropagate so our eighth grade horticulture class does that for them so they gave us a fifty thousand dollar greenhouse we give them back plants there's always a mutual benefit to all the partnerships and once in a while fire takes over our 150 acres because we have that it really looks like a dumb picture for me doesn't it yeah i wasn't that close to the fires the guy from the paper was like a mile away but um one of the reporters asked me and said oh isn't this horrible you, you know this big swatch of your of the riparian area burned and I said, no, it just, it's a new chapter in a textbook that we have kids use all the time. Fire is a natural thing. So kids got to watch how that was put out, what happened. And then we worked with a number of agencies. I've got a whole list of them here. The Mo Mojave Water Agency, the Mojave Desert Resource Conservation District, Fish and Game, Victor Valley College, and Flood Control in San Bernardino County. And the kids came up with a plan with scientists that came out from, from Washington how to repropagate an area that is a riparian area in a in a wetlands that has um, has a has a temporary water sources. So in the desert we get big storms that cause the floods, and then we get uh, little rain after that, just like over here. So the kids have replanted a large acreage of it and are measuring it. And this project will go on four or five six years. And so as they measure it, it'll be kids that are in elementary school coming up through that. Now, this, this is a participatory place. We have a lot of sports teams, like all high schools, and sports is also a place that we look at science. Working with Gaylord, we've designed our new gymnasium in that very, very way of, of looking at how we're going to measure science. So putting in a pressure-sensitive running track where kids can see how much pressure is put on their feet when they run, see how fast they run. Uh, we want to put in our, mark, our uh, scoreboards, be digital, in the gym so that when a student makes a layup we can instantly put up a, a dramatization or a, an animation of that and show all the math that's involved how many of you in this room would consider yourself math wizards one okay how many of you feel like math is a hard subject how many of you are mathophobic Okay, could you come up here with me? Come on, come on up. Come on, give him a hand. Give him, come on. Yeah, come on, come on up. Come on. I won't hurt you. The cortisol is running like crazy through that poor man's head. Okay, so softball, any of the sports, there is a lot of physics involved, right? Yes. Okay, so you're throwing, there is. You're throwing a ball, you're catching a ball, 
Has anybody ever wondered how one of those quarterbacks can throw somewhere, the guy isn't, and he catches it just on his fingertips? That's a lot, right? So, so if we're going to look at that in terms of math, this is what you usually see in the textbook, right? Consider that Sally's going to catch a softball. Well, that's a vector and a mass and a potential field, and really it's a differential equation that looks like this. Does that scare you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to teach you how to, how to do that just in no time. So step over here, okay? Now, the trouble is you can't use pencil, pencil or paper. We're running out of time. You have to do it quickly, okay? <laughs> so just, just stand over there. You're going to do it in your head. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. So you know what this all means is that there's an origin and an insertion, right? There's a place where the ball starts, a place where it ends. It's going to have an arc on it. It's going to travel at a certain speed, right? Okay, so you ready to do this? Yes. Hold out your hands because this will hurt otherwise. Perfect. See how you did? That's all that says, right? That's what it says, but you can do it. You did all that math in your head, right? Do you know what's wrong with this? What's wrong with math? It's a foreign language. Math is a foreign language. When we got the opportunity, that's all I need you for, but you did a great job. <laughs> Wow. Next time you have a math workshop, he's your guy. Okay. So isn't this what we see kids, right? And the math teacher is going, I don't know why they don't get it. You know, so easy. Well, math is a foreign language. Everything around you is science. What you're doing right now, the pain you're feeling in your seats because I've been talking so long, that's science. When you get in your car, it's physics. When you, get, when you go sit down and eat, there's all that biology that's going on. Everything in your life every day, from breathing to walking, is science. And kids love science. And do you know who in our schools are the best scientists? Kindergartners. They usually can't read, they can't write, and they don't know they can be wrong. And they don't care. So you give them any of this stuff, and they love doing it. And somehow we're able to beat that out of them and by the time they get to junior high, they hate science, and they hate math, and we say, now you get to do a lab. Yeah, I hate science. So we start early, right? We start at the bottom, and we say math is a foreign language. When we were asked to come to San Bernardino, UCR said to us, why don't we have a dual immersion school and science and math? And we said, what, are you crazy? But then they convinced us. And they have a B-clad program for their teachers, so almost every one of our teachers comes out of UCR. And that school is a dual immersion school. And what we discovered was, if we can learn how to teach children to be trilingual from the inner city who are poor, and they can do that, they can learn a fourth language. They can learn math. Because what we learn in the research about teaching a foreign language is the same thing we need to know about teaching the math language, right? So here we have these kids. The Norton Space and Aeronautics Academy is just renewing its charter for the first time. The Apple Valley's been there a long time, but they're renewing. They've only been in existence for three years. Already, the kids who started in second grade are fifth graders, and they are fully bilingual, right? These are poor, poor kids. 74% of them come from, uh, have AFDC or more. They come from homes where 30% of our families don't speak English, right? They're the kids that usually fail. And in San Bernardino City Unified, the reason that we were asked to come in, out of the 100 largest school districts in the nation, San Bernardino is number 100 in the amount of dropout, right? And it's killing the city. They can't get an educated workforce. So businesses are leaving. It's dying. So we're trying to find those things that they can use to get people going. Now, those kids usually don't come to school, but at our school they do. Now, we needed a band. We didn't have money. Charter schools make about 30% 30 30 less than traditional schools. But this worked really well, and they're marching in the San Bernardino parade and doing a good job and making a heck of a lot of noise. Good thing. Noise is science, remember, so everything is so. Okay. And now, uh, UCLA last year chose us as a Confucius Institute school. And so we have two Chinese teachers from Shanghai and a sister school in Shanghai. Um, 
that we'll be visiting when I'm in China in May. And uh, they teach Chinese now to our fifth, fourth and fifth graders. So our, our hope is that by the time they get to graduation, they'll know Mandarin, Spanish, and English. It has improved their writing skills tremendously. It has improved their reading skills, and math is easier for them. Okay. So we hope that maybe you'll come visit us at any of our sites. We're always anxious to have teachers come through share what we've learned, hear what you know, and what we could use from you. Because we're a research institution, we want to make sure that the, the things that we learn are transmitted to every school so that you can use those things. It's not a competition between us and you. It's us trying to develop the things we need. Over my time doing this over the last 27 years and more jogathons and bake sales than you've ever seen, two things have been said that I um, thought were, were interesting. Um, the first was towards the start when one of the administrators was exceptionally mad at me that we were building an observatory once we had the money on an elementary campus instead of their high school campus and turned in a meeting and said, you're just a kindergarten teacher, run amok. <laughs> I wear that with a badge of courage. So, and the other day at a meeting, um, they were talking about transformative education and what we were going to do in San Bernardino County. And one of the people said, you're just an anomaly. And I thought, well, of course we are. We're, we're a research center. But we're supposed to take that that is unusual and make it usual in all the schools. And that's what we're there for. So uh, to date, on our field trips from schools, we've had over 150,000 kids come through. We have 40,000 coming through on Gavert and about 100,000 coming through on uh, my mentor, on the K-16 bridge piece. So we're reaching a lot of kids, and uh, our whole goal is to reach them for as little money as possible from the schools. We know what you're up against, and we know what we're up against. So the, the radio telescope is free. You can do the training online. It takes about three hours. Any teacher can do that. You just uh, go on, get your little certificate, and you set a date, and your kids are running the radio telescope. Right now, Bridge for those schools costs $2 a child and does all those things. So we, um, we're in the business of building things that we think will help our sisters and brothers in the trenches, and that's what we do. Thank you for letting me be here.